What do everybody you say? So <laughs> it begins, right? We want to welcome uh, everybody. This has uh, become just a delightful conversation we're having. And of course, for those who are joining us uh, online, that's been just uh, also wonderful to see. Um, and we have, as I've told you before, about 50 to 60 people views uh, during the week. So people are going after the fact, people who are not here live. And uh, I've played it back a couple of times. I think it is instructive and a little bit entertaining. You're an entertaining group <laughs> because the conversation bounces around. And when it bounces around like that, for those who are watching it later on this week, they can hear all these comments and they can hear us uh, going back and forth. And I think it's instructive. I, I really do. So uh, we're really uh, happy about that. Uh, two uh, announcements before we continue. One is sort of before the official announcement, but uh, we are very happy to have uh, Brandy in for her interview this last week. Uh, she did not get approved by the council uh, for the call. So we communicated that to her. And uh, what, what we're going to do is the pastors here are going to cover um, for Will, so to speak, or cover that position through December. So that's going to be, we have four pastors, Bill and Frank out there, and Jose and me. And part of that is to say, let us get to know that community better ourselves. Let's spend some time where they get to know us, we get to know them. And I think it's going to be good for all of us. Um, and then in, it's beginning in January, what we'll probably do is have, uh, if she's ready, Beatrice will start as an intern there. And we'll probably also hire like a retired pastor to be out there with her. Now that has to still be decided. We still have to think that through. Uh, but if, if it was my internship, I wouldn't be, want to be out there all by myself. <laughs> it's nice to have someone else out there to work with, to, yeah. to help with the preaching. So you're not on every week. That's hard, even for a season person. And to have a new person having to preach every week is, is yeah. it's doable. People do it all the time. But I think this would be uh, better. And then sometime, probably next year, we'll put together a call committee uh, to uh, to tee it up and, and to see what kind of, but it gives us some time to think through what, what type of leader do we want out the park. And I think that that's good for everybody. So that's just where we are. And, and that's not an official announcement because that had, Tom has to make that, but that it's already been communicated. I have a question. Mm -hmm. With everybody, all these four passes helping out at the park, are you going to have someone to help you? <laughs> 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 the short answer is no, uh, but that's okay. That's okay. I'm, 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 that, that was uh, that, that's sort of the deal. Now, when I go out there, then Jose's got to fill in for me. But I think that's also good. That's good. Yeah. People really liked hearing um, him. And in fact, uh, um, what we're going to do, as you saw Sunday, we're going to add some little enhancements to the worship. Jane Gazdick is going to do some uh, cantering. Mm -hmm. And that's for us in the sanctuary, but it's mostly for those on live stream. So they're hearing a voice and can follow the worship and sing along. Our mics don't pick up the congregation. No. So if you're watching live stream, you know, we used to have Steve who could sing and, and they could follow him. But if he stops singing for whatever reason, yeah, and nobody wants to follow me when I'm singing. So, <laughs> so we brought, oh, let's have Jan do that. Not true. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you guys are listening. Okay. Um, I'm taking notes. I just want to know, uh, the, 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 the second thing is uh, we're going to have Jose and Jim Cooper um, do the absolution confession. So again, we have different voices uh, 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 up there, um, and that just it's you know it's not help in that sense, but I think it'll make a better experience. So we'll try little little things like that to um, to enhance our worship. So that's the first. The second is the Barbie video is out. <laughs> Has anyone seen the Barbie video yet? No. I'll wait till it's free. Because that you're, and you're <laughs> wait till it's <laughs> oh, 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 
Were you impressed that I wore pink? Yeah. <laughs> very, 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 very appropriate. What did you very think? Dapper, what did you? Well, I thought it was good. I I probably yeah I went there and I haven't seen the movie um, and not really thought about it relating back to Genesis two, but. I thought the points that you brought out and to now I'm going to go back and read that and probably rewatch your video again um, just because of that. But um, I thought the points that you brought out were very valid. Yeah. And to me, I think some of that, this is my personal opinion, I think some of that hooks into what we were talking about last week with the men oh, type thing. I see both of those working together. That's where my head was oh, during the film because yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, Ken is struggling with his identity. Yeah. And um, I don't want to rob the film, you know, oh, any Robin. spoiler works oh, here. Right. But, but, oh, but, yeah. but, but yeah, if we haven't seen it yet, <laughs> Ken is, is described at one point as just Ken. Yeah. <laughs> which is just a massive put down, you know, you're just Ken. You're not, in other words, you're not my husband. You're not my boyfriend. You're just Ken. You're just Ken. You know, and that's not cool. And then there's the follow-up in the movie, and you're going to have to figure out your identity too. I'm figuring out my identity as Barbie in this new world because she's now become a real girl, um, a real woman, and, and that's the end of the, the film. Is is kind. Of, I won't steal that because that's the punchline at the end of the whole film. <laughs> but uh, it, both of them have to find a, a new meaning now. What would be fun afterward is actually comparing the creation account in Genesis with how uh, uh, Greta Gerwig writes the creation account through Barbie and Ken, because she riffs off of it. She 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 takes some of the themes, but she uses them differently than what the Bible does, obviously, and that becomes, I think, a, a good exercise to say, okay, what is the Bible trying to lift up? And what is Greta trying to to say using the creation account? But she's using it um, for the for the whole Barbie film. So that was that's my only point. Is uh, someone says they're using the Bible, then that becomes interesting for us. You say, okay, let's take a look at how they used it, how it helps us understand the film, but also where does she, you know, move from the text? Where does she move from Genesis two? That's uh, enjoyable too. I didn't do that because that's a conversation for another day. Just a word of thanks. Thank you for the first sermon I've ever heard in a church last Sunday about wisdom. Oh, great. Oh, that was great. Yeah. 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 It was right about it. was fantastic. Yeah. And, I, and I was for wisdom, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it was great. Uh, uh, but I actually did look up, I did look up at Robert, and if you've come to these uh, gatherings, you'll know why. Uh, <laughs> that I said, you know, uh, uh, Solomon got in trouble uh, because he gave up wisdom. He gave up the fear of the Lord. I don't write it, Robert. <laughs> Oh, that's yeah, a weird fear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, did, he didn't flinch. He didn't flinch. <laughs> so that was good. Okay, we're, we're um, that's good. Isaiah is so important. We're spending two weeks on it. Uh, we mentioned this before. It's um, one of the most quoted texts in the New Testament. This is the one I think even Jesus discovers uh, his own identity through Isaiah, the suffering servant. Vicarious atonement. Um, vicarious. Uh, all, it's so important, <clears throat> a text for Israel, but also for, for uh, Jesus, and then I'd say for the early church. Uh, quotes Isaiah all the time. So it's important for us to have a good grasp of Isaiah. And here's the problem. It's hard to read. Do I hear an amen? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I had a dream about well, Hebrews, and that was really difficult. Uh, <laughs> but Isaiah, he's got wisdom literature in there. To me, mm -hmm. he's got previous things that happened in Israel. It, it, I think he's kind of like reading a good historical novel. Mm -hmm. yeah. His sons were even named Nine after his uh, his events. He had yeah. two sons. Yeah, that was pretty neat. Yeah. What what can you share? Shir Jasub, which means uh, remnant returns, mm -hmm. and then Mar Shaha Hashbaz means haste, spoil, speed, and pray. Mm. Oh, that was interesting. 
<laughs> so uh, I think that's a good analogy. It's a good it historical is. novel because some of us love history and so we'll jump into those novels, but some of us don't like history and we'd rather watch a romantic comedy, right? No. And, no, <laughs> you gotta watch football. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, but then there are, are, are some great uh, uh, sports films, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, if we are into history, then those novels make sense to us. And that's the point with Isaiah. Uh, some of us just get lost in the history. And therefore, when we're reading Isaiah, we quickly lose interest. And in church, we just pick out those beautiful yes. few texts, you know, that we like to even sing uh, <laughs> or, or other places. And so for us, Isaiah are those five or six texts that, that we read every year. And so we want to, again, return uh, to uh, the book read as much of it as we can, give as much as help to each other and support, because again, this is, this is one of those, those uh, texts in the Bible for serious readers of the Bible, you, you just can't overlook Isaiah. So that's, we can have history or too much history, I'm not always really sure, um, but I can't hold on to any of this either. I have to go back and you have to review, right? So this is where if you have a study Bible or a commentary, <laughs> I like it when there's a good introduction in your Bible that can review some of this, because after a while you're going to forget, and then it's good. Oh, when you review it, you say, "Okay, now I remember. Now I remember." Until the next time. So let's go and and say there are at least three different historical periods here that we have to keep in mind, and these are important for the rest of our reading of the Old Testament, because <clears throat> this time of Isaiah, the span of Isaiah is also the span of the major prophets and the minor prophets. So all the prophets are gonna fit to this time period. Yeah. We can determine the, the minor prophets. We pretty well know when they wrote. Isaiah spans all this time. So it, think 200 years. That's what I have my 200 years. Isaiah's written over 200 years. So pre-exile pretty much is focused on the Northern Kingdom where Isaiah comes. And this is probably the original Isaiah and says, God's judgment's coming. And it's going to come through the Assyrians. So all of a sudden, when you're talking about the Assyrians, you know you, you, you've placed yourself in, into the history. And I've written up here 740 to 681 BC, pre-exile. In that time, Isaiah is astute politically. I mean, as far as international relations. And he knows it's not just going to be Assyria in the future. It's also going to be Babylon. Babylon. And he hints at that. So here's, there's the intrigue and probably the power of this school of thought was the prophet was ripe. Those things happen. And that gave force to other things as we'll see in, in the video today. He wrote other things down and gave them to his students. They were passed on for 150 to 200 years. And as uh events are unfolding with the exile people are going oh wow he was right exactly right and so that enhanced other judgments other things that he had written down and given to his students uh who then pick up on this and write more over that 200 year period so pre-exile was probably the original isaiah and just the original isaiah the second, we think about 586, that's when the South is destroyed and goes to Babylon. So now we've moved from Assyria, destroyed the North, and really destroyed it. But Assyria, remember, tries to take over Jerusalem. They hold a siege. Never worked. Never worked. God always uh, uh, saves Judah, saves Jerusalem. Uh, but in 586, no. There a portion 
who knows how many, 50%, 60%, who knows, <coughs> sent into exile, but not everybody we know. Some of um, <coughs> the remnant stay in and around Jerusalem. Some of them go to Petra, right? Ooh. They're scattering all over the place. Why would you go to Petra? It's safe. If, has anyone been there? Yeah. yeah. Well, you're, 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 Christians, by the way, went there after the persecution in 70 AD. Mm. And so there was always persecutions somewhere, and people would flee many times to Petra because it was financially prosperous. You could make a living. It was uh, <laughs> cosmopolitan, people from all over the place. It was safe because it's hard to conquer. <laughs> Once you get in there, yeah, in. Uh, <laughs> it, it's hard to, you know, it's easy to defend. With this question, though, about the tribes, I still to this day cannot <laughs> figure out why the 10 tribes and the two tribes split and don't create an alliance. If they create an alliance, they have a chance that they tried, but didn't work. It didn't. So yeah. why doesn't it work? Why can't they align with each other? They come from a common faith, a common belief system. And, and this is the missing yeah. piece here. Judah made a pact with Assyria to destroy Israel. <laughs> well, so no. what, what, you know, I keep asking why. Okay, why are they with a common heritage, common belief system, common Bible, not able to work together as a team? Why do we have North Korea and South Korea? Why do we have France and Germany? Why do we have the United States and we have Texas? Right. You guys clearly have not been to Texas. I have. I think the, what was the old British, the the line it was a Churchill's line about the, the British and the Americans, you know, were were, were uh, separated what, by a common language. Yeah, we're, we're <laughs> people <laughs> separated by a common language. Yes. So the Bible does give an answer, but it gives a spiritual answer to that question. Now there's political um, issues, obviously, but and I mentioned it Sunday in the sermon. Actually, Solomon loved foreign wives. Mm -hmm. And started to worship the foreign gods. So he loved women, period. Yeah, he did well. <laughs> <laughs> if you got 700 wives and 300 concubines, that's a good characteristic to have. I think. Uh, now, we know a lot of that was political, but not all of it was political. He obviously uh, um, <clears throat> fell in love with, with, I don't know, many of them. I don't know. Uh, but he set up temples for them. And they became then demagogues. As soon as you set up a temple, that's a demagogue. <laughs> uh, depending on your cosmology, it's either a demagogue or it's God. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, and so we we saw it in the text last time, chapter 11 in First Kings, I think, where um, First Kings chapter 3 talks about Solomon and his wisdom. Talks about that story last week, you know, where he asked God for wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could have asked for anything, asked for wisdom because he says, I'm young, I'm inexperienced, I need help ruling this people. Chapter three goes into some wonderful detail about uh, how wise he is. But remember, that little dialogue happened in his dreams. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine him. The only reason we know about it is he came out and said, You know, I had this dream, and God came and spoke to me. And you can imagine what some of his advisors thought. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the writer knows this too. And so the writer spends eight chapters telling us that indeed it was God because the proof was in the pudding. <laughs> and everyone comes. Queen of Sheba comes, you know, and says, he's the wisest I've ever seen. Look at his riches. Everybody's happy. Uh, the harem's happy. The citizens are happy. Uh, yeah. The warriors are happy. Uh, he must be a wise man. And he's become fabulously wealthy. Yeah. A wise man. And so then we have the, you know, the baby who's going to be uh, uh, cut in half, the two women fighting over the baby. It was switched at night. Remember, one baby dies, the other baby lives. They switch them. There's a fight. They bring it to Solomon. He says, I got, I got an answer. Mm -hmm. Give me a sword. We'll divide them, divide the baby, and give each mother a half. Of course, then the real mother's heart goes out to the baby, and then Solomon goes, "Aha! 
you're the real mommy. You're the real mom. And everybody goes, oh, he's wise. <laughs> Problem solved. So that works for eight chapters until chapter 11 at First Kings, where it says, um, but Solomon loved many foreign mm. women. And of course, it wasn't that they were foreign, and it wasn't that they were many. It was that it was idolatry. Yeah. That is becomes the issue here. And he it mentions two of the gods. I'm going to look that up in first uh, yeah. first Kings oh, eleven. I think it's Madoc. Mm -hmm. I can't remember that one. Uh, I think it was of the the Mede, the, the Midianites and the Edomites, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. But neighbors. Oh, I think so. Some of the neighbor gods, and it could be. Um, there are some agricultural problems, and, and Solomon's starting to say, well, maybe those gods have something to provide. And when they pray, it rains. You know, when they, uh, when they pray, the, the, the corn grows, the wheat grows, whatever it might be. So I'm going to hedge my bet, right? And that's sort of paganism in the Greek and the, the Roman world. You hedge your bets, right? You say, well, no, no one has all the truth. So we'll pray to all the gods. <laughs> Maybe we'll get it right. You know? we'll, we'll, we'll cover the, the waterfront, so to speak. So, uh, so they say, because of his unfaithfulness, God comes to Solomon and says, I'm going to divide the kingdom and your, your, your kids are going to fight over it and split. But I will not punish you. I will not have the separation of the kingdom under your rule, only in deference to David, your father. Now, that's how the Bible answers that question. So God intercedes and lets them split instead of giving a vision for how they could be united. Now that's going to be Isaiah's. Mm, he warns them. Isaiah's going to come now, okay, in the post exile. Now we're in the post exile and you're going to give that vision of the united Israel, right? Now the 10 tribes are gone. So there's no, you can't unite something that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but there is that vision of Israel under a united Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be, but not just for the 12 tribes, but for the whole world. So Isaiah's vision here uh, from 40 to 66 is massive. And he's going to go back. He's going to go back to the Abrahamic covenant and the Noahic the Noah, the covenant with Noah, that you, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing to all nations. And of course, then because Isaiah picks up that vision, then Matthew picks up that vision, quoting, right? Jesus at the end saying, uh, go ye therefore and <clears throat> disciple all nations. So this whole service to the nations is passed from Noah to Abraham through the prophets, Isaiah in particular, then to the New Testament writers. Jesus also then says, this is, this is the vision, united now united Israel and United Church serving the world. So it's essentially a house divided against itself cannot stand. <laughs> and it didn't stand. <laughs> yeah. And it didn't stand. Yeah, well, I think it actually goes back. To so so right Robert, you but just think of when that. they're coming back from the exile, they're trying to figure this out. They're asking your questions. Why did this happen to us? Yeah. And so when we read the prophets, especially in this era, we're going to get answers. They're going to interpret why it was that God did what God did, and what have we learned? So, but think now, two hundred years, and uh, before we watch the, the the clip, I want to do two things. The first is to say, you know, when I went, I was a psychology major initially, and you know, we're up in Minnesota, so Skinner, uh, had lived, uh, Skinner had lived down the block from the seminary, and. Uh, and had a real influence, uh, not just on, on uh, the neighborhood, but uh, of course, the University of Minnesota. So I studied Skinner because I didn't trust Freud. Uh, <laughs> you should have studied Jung. No, uh, so, so I just wanted to say, well, if I, if I could rule the world with m &Ms, you know, and, and you could, <laughs> with a few pellets, you could make, you know, like rats do just about anything. Uh, and that appealed to me. <laughs> at that time. So if I wrote anything building on his theories, my professor would say, oh, you're a Skinnerian. Right? Or if you wrote according to Jung, you're a Jungian yeah. or you're a Freudian. Right. So I think that way about 
writing with his words, with his ideas. So even though you're writing 150, 200 years after the prophet, you're still a Isaiah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I think that that's really important. Let's though just get some taste before we jump in and, and go to uh, 40. Remember the second Isaiah, which is exile, post-exile, starts with chapter 40. And it starts very differently than judgment, right? And we know this passage. This passage is well known to us. But notice it starts with a different tone. It's not, okay, God's coming. God's coming. You've sinned. God's coming with punishment. Uh, repent. Rather, uh, could someone just start us off on that on, on chapter 4? We'll just read a couple of verses. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall be made level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All peoples are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, let, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up and do not be afraid, says the town. Say to the town of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Okay. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Now, when, when you run into this language at the end, what are you thinking of? When, uh, uh, that God is like a shepherd. <laughs> I shall not want. I mean, Right now, that was written 500 years before. <clears throat> you think about Psalm 23. Yeah, in the New Testament, when uh, Christ does that good shepherd, uh, you know, the, I think it's John, but I'm not sure about that. But the good shepherd thing is a mirror of this. Absolutely. They're picking up on, I think David starts using that metaphor because he had been a shepherd. Um, remember, shepherds were not highly regarded. We get that in the New Testament too. Uh, uh, the angels come and and um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to put down any any. Uh, but it'd be like a, a night watchman, and in most of our places, the night watchmen don't make great salaries, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the shepherds were like that. And yet they were watching all the wealth of that mm -hmm. person, right. that, all that wealth, mm -hmm. and they were nothing. Yeah. And, and and often the, actually it wasn't a, a paid position. So often it was like a, a, a smaller child, you know, the youngest, yeah. you know, of, of the litter. That was David. Remember, he was the youngest. So you send the youngest out there to do that because the other boys were you know bigger and and could work the fields. That was more valuable, so to speak, than than just tending the shop. But here David says, you know, I had to fight off. Wild lions. I had to do some pretty serious uh, night watchman stuff. So he lifts up the metaphor, and we still use it today. For a good leader, is a good shepherd. We we tend to value the metaphor highly, but here you can see him using that. But also, Ufta, you know, I mean, uh, people are like grass. God breathes, and grass fades. Because these people post exile have gone through a lot of loss. It reminds me of Ecclesiastes. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die. That's good. That's what this reminds me of. So there's a lot going on here, but you can notice the tone. 
This is not about as much judgment as this comfort, comfort you, my people, mm -hmm. which is this, you know, you you paid double. You paid double than what you deserve. Handles Messiah. That's right. Yeah. I haven't known from a previous Bible. So <laughs> comfort, comfort my people. Anybody want to sing that for us? That's <laughs> it's, it's an aria. Well, remember? You know, yeah. and I, I, don't, I don't know that one as well. And I think that's for the men. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that part. Yeah, that part. Uh, so let's go to Psalm 53, is another um, in this. <laughs> Again, uh, uh, this is one of the most complex images in Isaiah and becomes one of the most complex theological debates um, today, going back to this time. Who is the suffering servant in Isaiah? So that's like Sunday school. Jesus is always the right answer. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're never going to say no. Um, but you'll want to you'll want to work for that answer. You don't want to just give the easy answer. Um, obviously, it's complex because some would say, especially in the Jewish community, it's Israel mm. as as a community. Christians have picked up on this and said, "Oh, the church is also we're called to be suffering servants in following Jesus." Mm -hmm. So the easy answer gets complex the more you look at it right. and the more you read Isaiah to see how he's describing uh, that role. But if we could hear now Psalm, uh, uh, excuse me, Isaiah 53, uh, notice what he's writing here and where your mind goes immediately, right? The associations that you make. Well, let's see, you want to? Sure. I think you're our reader. Okay. <laughs> Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, yet all, yet who of his generation protested, for he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And, the, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by, the, by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. Exactly. Amen. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Remember, this is written over wow. 500 years before right. Jesus. Jesus. We're lost. Hmm? Was it? What was what were you reading, Melissa? Isaiah, Isaiah, 53. Isaiah, 53. Isaiah 53. Okay, because yep. uh, my translation was very different. 
We we thought you said Psalm 53. Oh, yeah, I, had, I might have said that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to, to this day, the shop. Be behind me, you devil. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And interesting that he'd say it that way, uh, because obviously that was a, a form of temptation. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe you don't have to die. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all Matthew's gospel, right? Chapter four, Satan says you don't have to die. Don't go through all that <laughs> Isaiah fifty-three more. stuff. I'll give you the right off the bat. You don't have to go through the death stuff and all this Isaiah 53 stuff. I'll just give it to you in order for you to get your mission accomplished. Yeah, of it's pretty tempting. Yeah. 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 You know, the visuals we have of Jesus, they must not have read that. Oh, I mean, he's pretty good looking in the pictures we have. Not here. Yeah, no, no, not here. Mm -hmm. He is not Cary Grant in no. Isaiah 53. And that's important in the telling because they're not following him because he's charismatic, because mm -hmm. we want to make him charismatic, mm -hmm. we want to make a great teacher and healer, and, and he looks great in white robes, you know. Um, he's got great nice halo. Um that's not the description not, not here. Not that's the for Jesus is it gonna for the kiss? That's an interesting point too, because like in the chosen that Jesus is very endearing, he's very mm -hmm. handsome, mm -hmm. which I, I get all that, but I would say that we're not mature enough to handle, you know, we wouldn't even entertain it if we looked and we saw a sort of disfigured Jesus or or just mm -hmm. your average plain person, <clears throat> uh, right? And you might not even watch five minutes of it in our culture right? you see that in stained glass windows and art too all the apostles are always 60 70 80 year old yeah. men with long beards right yeah. they're all yeah. very attractive they were probably 20 30 year old right. you know <laughs> and they were fishermen <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know he looks pretty normal yeah. because when he was portrayed by <laughs> judas and he was identified with the kiss they say he was the seven foot dude or the good looking guy over there so they didn't know him from anybody else. Yeah, he wasn't wearing the, the only one wearing white robes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, David was considered ruddy and handsome. Yes. That's the, uh, and Saul was considered A big tall. tall and kingly, yes. right? So that's important for leaders. It's not, and, and so it's interesting the Bible here takes mm -hmm. the exact opposite mm -hmm. and says, uh, this guy is, uh, what, what's it say? What's the exact quote? Years, the appearance yeah. was so disfigured he thought no, beyond any man so marred was his appearance beyond yeah. human someone he has no state <laughs> and his form was mentions. beyond that of mortals he shall startle many nations kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which had not been told them they shall see and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate and then it goes into who has believed who, what was the film? Uh, then we'll roll the tape that you can get ready, Howard. The, um, the film of, of Christ's death, it was Mel Gibson. Yeah, Mr. Right. Of Passion. 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 Mm -hmm. I think that film, Mel Gibson was trying to get at this. Oh, yeah. Um, the brutality, mm -hmm. the torture surrounding crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Because that's hard. Aramaic everyone... was like auditorily, that was. A it's whole hard new world to go into just like watching a a, a, a more realistic world war ii film mm -hmm. from the soldier's perspective is hard to watch right because war is hard so we we sanitize it it's the only way we can watch certain things and i think that was mel gibson's goal is to show us more accurately the brutality mm -hmm. and that jesus isn't shining on the cross or glowing or that type that of was a really difficult film to watch because we don't want to think about jesus in that you know like mm -hmm. totally sorry jesus called him was pastor frank thing god calling <laughs> <laughs> okay we want to we want to watch this now uh again the bible project uh wants to say there are two basic books in Isaiah 139 and then 60 to 66. But I've told you before, some scholars actually will divide it into three, starting with um, 60, the glory of Zion. Uh, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of your Lord rises up. There's always these choir things that uh, look that up. But some would put a third section there as well. Uh, but that's not the Bible project. They're, they're going to divide this into two. All right? All right, let's roll. Oh. Oh, <laughs>
The book of the prophet Isaiah. In the first video, we explored chapters 1 to 39, which was Isaiah's message of judgment and hope for Jerusalem. He accused Israel's leaders of rebellion against God and said that through Assyria and then Babylon, Israel's kingdom would come crashing down in an act of God's judgment. And so chapter 39 concludes with Isaiah predicting Jerusalem's fall to Babylon in the exile. And a hundred years after Isaiah, it all sadly came to pass. But Isaiah's greater hope was for a new purified Jerusalem where God's kingdom would be restored through the future messianic king and all nations would come together in peace. And so chapters 40 and following explore this great hope. The first main section, chapters 40 to 48, open with an announcement of hope and comfort for Israel. The people are told that the Babylonian exile is over and that Israel's sin has been dealt with, a new era is beginning. So they should all return home to Jerusalem where God himself will bring his kingdom and all nations will see his glory. Now, let's stop for a moment because this opening announcement raises a big question, that is, who is saying all of this? Whose voice are we hearing in these words of hope? The perspective of the prophet in these chapters is that of somebody who's living after the exile, in other words, in the time period described by Ezra and Nehemiah. But Isaiah died 150 years before any of that. So what are we supposed to make of this? Well, there are many who think that it's still Isaiah in his own day speaking, but that he's been prophetically transported, so to speak, 200 years into the future, and that he's speaking to future generations as if the exile is past. However, the book of Isaiah itself gives us some clues that something else is probably going on. In chapters 8 and 29 and 30, we're told that after Isaiah was rejected by Israel's leaders, that he wrote and sealed up in a scroll all of his messages of judgment and hope, and that he passed it on to his disciples as a witness for days to come. Eventually, Isaiah died, waiting for God to vindicate his words. Now remember, chapters 1 to 39 were designed to show us that Isaiah's predictions of judgment were fulfilled in the exile. He's a true prophet. And so after exile is over, Isaiah's disciples, who have treasured his words for so long, open up the scroll and begin applying his words of hope to their own day. So on this view, the book of Isaiah consists of that first collection of Isaiah's words, as well as the writings of his prophetic disciples that God uses to extend Isaiah's message of hope to future generations. Whichever view you end up taking, everybody agrees that these chapters are announcing that the future hope has come, that God is fulfilling Isaiah's prophetic promises. And so the prophet hopes that Israel will respond by becoming God's servant. That is, after experiencing God's justice and mercy through history, that they will now begin to share with the nations who God truly is. But that's not what's happening. Israel, instead of bearing witness to the nations, is actually complaining and even <laughs> accusing God. They say, the Lord doesn't pay attention to our trouble. In fact, he's ignoring our cause. The Babylonian exile, under understandably, caused Israel to lose faith in their God. I mean, maybe he's not that powerful. Maybe the gods of Babylon are way greater than our God. And so the rest of these chapters, 41 to 47, are set up like a trial scene. God is responding to these doubts and accusations with the following arguments. He says first that the exile to Babylon was not divine neglect. Rather, it was divinely orchestrated as a judgment for Israel's sin. And second, it was for Israel's sake that God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon so they could come back home fulfilling Isaiah's words. So the right conclusion that Israel should draw is that their God is the king of history, not the idols of the nations. In the fall of Babylon and the rise of the Persian king Cyrus, Israel should see God's hand at work and so become his servant, telling the nations who he is. But by the end of the trial, chapter 48, we find that Israel is still as rebellious and hard hearted as their ancestors. And so God disqualifies them as his servant, but God still is on a mission to bless the nation. And so the prophet says God's going to do a new thing to solve this problem, which moves into the next section, 49 to 55. We're introduced to a figure who's called God's servant, who's going to fulfill God's mission and do what Israel has failed to do. 
God gives this servant the title Israel and sends this person on a mission to first of all restore the people of Israel back to their God but second to become God's light to the nations and we're told that this servant is empowered by God's spirit to announce good news and to bring God's kingdom over all of the nations it sounds just like the messianic king from chapters 9 and 11 but then we learn the surprising way of how the servant will bring God's kingdom he's going to be rejected and beaten and ultimately killed by his own people. In reality, as he's being accused and sentenced to death, he's dying on behalf of the sin of his own people. The prophet says the servant's death is a sacrifice of atonement for the people's evil and rebellion. And then after his death, all of a sudden, the servant is just alive again. And we hear that by his death, he provided a way to make people righteous. That is, to put them in a right relationship with God. And so this section concludes by describing two ways people can respond to the servant. Some will respond with humility and turn from their sins and accept what God's servant did on their behalf. These people are called the servants and also the seed. Remember the holy seed from chapter 6. These are the ones who will experience the blessing of the messianic kingdom. But there are others who are called simply the wicked, and they reject both the servant and his servants, which brings us to the final section of the book, 56 to 66, where the servants inherit God's kingdom. These chapters are beautifully designed as a symmetry that brings together all of the themes of the book. At the very center are three beautiful poems that describe how the spirit-empowered servant is announcing the good news of God's kingdom to the poor, and he reaffirms all of the promises of hope from earlier in the book. The new Jerusalem, inhabited by God's servants, will be the place from which God's justice and mercy and blessing flow out to all the nations of the world. And surrounding these poems are two long prayers of repentance, where the servants confess Israel's sin, and they grieve over all of the evil they see in the world around them and so they ask God to forgive them and that his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. Now on each side of these prayers are collections of more poems that contrast the destiny of the servants with that of the wicked who persecute them. God says he's going to bring his justice on all who pollute his good world with their evil and selfishness and idolatry and that he's going to remove them from his city forever. But the servants, those who are humble before God and who repent and own their evil, they are forgiven and they will inherit the new Jerusalem, which we discover is an image for an entirely renewed creation where death and suffering are gone forever. And this brings us to the very outer frame of this part of the book. In this renewed world of God's kingdom, people from all nations are invited to come and join the servants of God's covenant family so that everyone can know their creator and redeemer. And so the book of Isaiah ends with the very grand vision of the fulfillment of all of God's covenant promises. Through the suffering servant king, God creates a covenant family of all nations who are awaiting the hope of God's justice and bringing a renewed creation, where God's kingdom finally comes here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the very powerful hope of the book of Isaiah. <laughs> All right. What do you think? I just heard that uh, it's true. He, one of the things I like about this is they consolidate so much information in a short amount of time. Here's one where we can actually play it back a second time again, because there's just so much happening uh, in Isaiah, right? I think someone said that what we need is AI to help us uh, <laughs> consolidate. Initial impressions before we go to smoke. What, what struck you? What, what, what did you notice as, as they were going through the description of this um, this section, the second section of Isaiah? The beautiful poetry of Isaiah, the, the way this thing is written, it's almost like a song. I mean, it's just, it it's yeah. just beautiful. And throughout, I think that's a, a unifying theme through it. Whoever wrote this was an artist and big time. And um, um, 
in my notes, my study notes says Isaiah is a, a encapsulation of the entire Bible. And I agree with that. There is so much here, so much prophecy, so much revelation, so much of it, everything. I mean, it's a, a true telling of our history as Christians. And yet Christianity was 500 years in the future. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's amazing. You, if you look at chapters 39 and 40, you can see a little bit about what Patrick is saying, that you have the, the, the narrative there in 39, and it, most Bibles will have it written as a narrative, like just in your regular block form. And then when you go to 40, it's poetry, and you can see the poetry is shows up differently in your text. Do we see that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we're yeah. always looking, and then if you follow forty and you keep going, you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is all poetry, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. There's no more of that block text anymore. It's all it's poetry over. for the most part. Let's see. Mm -hmm. it. So in forty-four, there's some here. Okay, let's check forty-four. Mm -hmm. It just, it it's written as, I mean, I, yeah, uh, just a few things, just like uh, yeah. the Lord, my idols, and, and a couple of headings. Um, uh, so it's, it's just really interesting that you have a much more narrative in 1 to 39, although I think it's probably still mostly poetry. And it's like, like Proverbs, these are deep nuggets. I mean, like in, you know, you you look at uh, just in uh, chapter 40, it says he's talking about the stars. He calls them all by names. Um, I lift up my eyes on high. I see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their hosts by number. He calls them by name. I mean, God calls the stars by name. Um, so, I mean, it's, it, it, there's just deep, profound nuggets on every verse. I, I do think poetry was another way that uh, an oral culture can communicate and you hold on to it, right? Like we would say music, right? Yeah. When you hear a musical line, you can hold on to it better than you can just a, a narration. Mm -hmm. And my guess is this is beautiful poetry. This is elevated poetry. And um, this would be like someone re reciting Shakespeare. It, it's, it's elevated, right? It's a, and, but e more easily to grasp, right? To hold on to. Mm -hmm. Is that what you used to teach, Edie? Mm -hmm. Rick, I think Jim's got raised an interesting point about how this is rememberable and there are places, as you mentioned in Proverbs, it's also Ecclesiastes that, where you know the race is not to the swiftest and you know some of those things are one of the things that stands out to me when i read them is that they seem very spiritually inspired but there's something that says it speaks deeply to my soul in this kind of commentary versus a lot that goes oh my god you know if i go into numbers and how long a rabbi's beard should be <laughs> <laughs> some of us Who that's cares? an important text for some of us. <laughs> <laughs> but but these, these tend to have much more meaning to them. Yeah. And I, I think that's what speaks to us is there's a meaning, there's a purpose, and there's a universality to it. So this is just as universal today, mm -hmm. seems Absolutely. than some of the other passages that you know are related to the circumstances of the day. It was like you know, reading an old newspaper, whereas this is these seem like they come from God. Good. Other other insights from it's too much. You know, my little brain cannot comprehend. I wish we could go what, and take maybe chapter two chapters yeah. and really digest it and the poetry. I mean, I've been trying to read it and I thought it's the one. I've, re I've read words. I'm not getting the meaning. You know, I'm just, I was overwhelmed. Yeah. And, and that's and part of the point was, is is that sometimes it's the history that, yeah. but sometimes it's just the density of insight, the, the yeah. fullness of the text, yeah. and you want to say, oh, I got to put that down. Mm -hmm. that's right. That there's so much going on here. I got I got to just think about that one. Yeah. 
it skips around a real lot. Yeah. And I, I kept saying in my head the, the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. <laughs> <laughs> Overwhelmed. <laughs> Matt, you were... No, I just said it skips around a lot. Like the structure of the book I have goes from messianic hope to the motif of the city, the holy one of Israel, faith response of the Jews, special literary features. It just, he goes one and then he goes into another and then it keeps on going, but then it comes back to that again. So I think that's why it's kind of hard to understand. But they're all connected. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, we've got that... Um, in you know that thing in some of our tv <laughs> shows now especially the series you know when you watch you know, we all love a certain series uh and then you'll watch it and and they introduce characters in the first couple uh weeks but then they start to thicken the plot and then they go back right now you <laughs> bounce back to a previous time and then they're going to fill in that yeah. and we know how to read that right? Because there's a certain vocabulary in how stories are told. This would be very similar with I Isaiah, that there's a certain, we I find it difficult too. But uh, I think it's told in a way that, that the people of the day would have said, they get that way of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And then, and like a musical, you know, how when the lovers all of a sudden, you know, uh, when the tension builds between the two lovers, they break into song. Mm -hmm. But you got that here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Breaks into poetry. I was like, yeah. song, 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 song. Right? Uh, and so much of it. So, what's that? I said it, it has such an appropriate ending. Yeah. I love the ending of it. Oh. What? Any in particular, then, Well, no, just the whole message of whole thing. Message. Yeah. And I think, I, think uh, I, I misspoke. I think it's the last. Third Isaiah, which I'll read in some commentators, is not 60 to, to the end, but 56 to 66. Mm -hmm. I think that was it. Let me just read before we go to our small group 42. Isaiah 42. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's go with that. <laughs> Again, this is kind of what you were saying, another of the beautiful nuggets, and then you just want to stop. In fact, I can't even read the whole chapter. You just want to stop even halfway through and say, okay, let me just ponder that one for a second servant of the lord right here is my servant whom i uphold my chosen one in whom i delight i will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations again not to not to jerusalem everybody it sounds like the baptism doesn't it yeah absolutely he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not be snuffed out in faithfulness he will bring forth justice and he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth in his law the islands will put their hope so i mean obviously that's what we're thinking about baptism for jesus and, and this is often quoted again uh, for jesus or you can start again um uh, eight, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, a new thing I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. The whole idea of a new thing that we talk about, the new creation. Boy, we just are all over this text, and we use it quite a bit. Or one more uh, beginning on 10. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the ends of the earth. I mean, it's almost quoting the Psalms here, right? Uh, you who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and all who live in them, let the desert and its towns raise their voices. Let the settlements where uh, Kedar lives rejoice. Let the people of, let them shout from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise in the islands. The Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over the enemies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, oh, I, I can keep going here. For a long time, I've kept silent. I've been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I grasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and the hills. So, so now he's going to go into judgment. So there is that bounce, always bouncing back and forth uh, between judgment and hope. All right, let's uh, get into our groups. And again, trying to lift out. So let's, let's remember Edie's comment here. Let's not get overwhelmed, right. but are there, because we are, right? Mm -hmm. Isaiah is just that way, <laughs> which is why like a long novel, you know, you kind of have to savor it. 
What? War and Peace. War and Peace. Yeah, yeah. Uh, volume one and volume two. Yeah. This is that kind of read. So you got to uh, savor it. So it, pick out things that you want to savor, that you want to hold on to. So it doesn't, you don't lose it all, because that's what can happen. All right. So get in the groups and share. Um, and for those uh, live stream, we'll put you into a group right now as well. Oh, there's Lee. Why don't we all say hi to Lee? You know, just the way. Hey, Lee. I miss everybody. I really do. I wish I were there right this minute. <laughs> now, shout out to Jan, who's still there. Hi, Jan. Jan and I just had, I want you to know Jan and I were it and our small work, but that's okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we talked about Isaiah a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Barbie, the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah, you were discussing Barbie the rest of the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to tell you though, uh, so I announced at the live service uh, that we're going to do the same Barbie. I walked out and there were these two young women. Uh, who are their names again? Uh, Clara and Olivia. Right. And they wanted to talk about Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> they had opinions. <laughs> and they didn't agree with each other. And it was just a wonderful conversation. It just was a great nuanced Have conversation. Have they already seen the movie? I think so because they had yes. they had yeah, strong yeah. feelings yeah. Yeah. with their mom too. So it was yeah. the, the three. I think that's the perfect scenario. You go with other women, or you go with your kids or grandkids or your mom or, or friend because you're going to want to discuss it afterward. You know, uh, pros and cons and all that other good stuff. It's it, it's a, a feast for the eyes, but boy, it, it raises up issues you want you just want to talk about. You know? Sure. So, we have ever thought of having a group from the church go and then have a discussion afterwards? That would that would be great. Edie, Edie, why don't you get your sister's group to go? Yeah, we could do that. That's a good that's a good uh, idea. I'll talk you about got a that. captured audience there, just move them to the theater. <laughs> right. Okay. And we'll want to see idea. pictures of each of you in the Barbie box. Uh, <laughs> uh, That's my pain. favorite part of the video that when Adriana put me in a Barbie box, when, when she says just Ken, when I'm talking about just Ken, just Ken in the Barbie <laughs> 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 and if it's too much, you can just come out of the theater and walk in to see Tom Cruise Mission Impossible. So, Edie, when you go with the sisters group, make sure you uh, invite Matt and Ray and, uh, and Bob. And, uh, I want to say I was the only guy there. Does anybody know how long it's going to be on? That makes you a man. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it makes me brave. <laughs> My guess is it'll be on until they stop making money. Right? They're not going to stop. Oh, yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. How long is it usually? A couple of weeks? I don't know. But it's on multiple screens. So I, my guess is they'll probably uh, reduce it at some point this summer and it'll be just one yeah. screen. But yeah. right now, it's, it's going pretty hard uh, on all the screens. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, uh, anything you want to lift up from your conversations? Things that you discussed? We buried all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> we only talked about Isaiah a little bit. Also. Yeah. But we talked about his lack of charisma and good looks and how that affects a lot of people. You know, and you know, presidential elections, you go for the most charismatic and uh and that he came as a suffering servant, it was not 
he was not automatically um, having people attracted to him. That's right. And um, that gives the rest of us hope too. I mean, you, you can almost okay, sense the critique of the <laughs> soldiers at the foot of the cross. Did you read that right? When they're mocking Jesus, is this the king of the Jews? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's that sort yeah. of. Uh, uh, and, and remember in Christian art, they, uh, um, even the Christian artists did not depict the crucifixion for three, four, five generations, about 500 years. Because how, how do you paint that? Because it was shameful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Humble doesn't get at it. Disgraceful, uh, uh, brutal, you know, and that's my Lord. And I, so, so they struggled for, for long periods of time. How do we paint the, the death of Christ? And how do we do it in jewelry? It's always uh, sanitized and. Uh, yeah, well, how much blood and guts do you wear? Uh, yeah, you know, exactly. On your, yeah. on your neck, right? That's, so that gets at the, 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 the sensitivities. That's why I mentioned, and I was glad you'd seen the Mel Gibson depiction. Mm -hmm. Uh, because he wants to break through that. Mm -hmm. And it is hard then to stay even in the theater to keep your eyes on it. Yeah. Sometimes you just want to say, wait a minute, I gotta mute that. I, I can't, I just can't watch it anymore. Right. Just like a war film. Sometimes if it's really realistic, you, you just gotta go, mm, I don't, you know, yeah. go back to the romantic comedy. You know, I, I just can't. This is an it. FYI too. You know, he's doing a follow-up movie now. Yes. With the resurrection and Jim oh. is gonna, mm -hmm. Play the part again. We discussed a little bit about the how the Holy Spirit is implicit in this. You don't even the Trinity, of course, is from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And in Isaiah, it's not difficult to see God the Father and God the Son. Mm -hmm. But where does the Holy Spirit show yeah. up? Yeah, and then I was thinking, saying. speaking through the yeah. prophets, yeah. which is mm -hmm. one of the jobs mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. is that, you know, is it an implied? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want him just to have a cameo appearance, you know, because <laughs> oh. it parts of the Trinity. But we did read. Um, that one piece here where he was given the spirit. The spirit of the Lord. Oh, yeah. 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 So the spirit of the Lord. Six. Uh, what? It's in chapter six, uh, verse eight. So it does show up, but it's not prominent. Mm -hmm. However, at this time, it's still the spirit is given to specific people for specific reasons. Oh, okay. It's not, I'm pouring out my spirit upon all flesh. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, those are other prophets yeah. who will get a more robust, I would say, uh, uh, theology and spirit. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I think, you know, just a lot of this kind of back to Robert, too. A lot of the reading I would say, you just get this tingling, like, wow. Yeah. That that's where this comes. I mean, that's yeah. where that great that's where passage comes. comes from. That's where that great yeah, thought feet. comes from. And so I liked that of the Bible, the Bible project like gave you different segments to rethink and reread Isaiah, given okay, I'm pre-chapter 40, post chapter 40. Mm -hmm. And I think there's that, and you know, Pastor Rick, my thought too is everybody kind of lifts up Romans. Right in the New Testament, like if there was only Romans and Isaiah, you, you could, you know, all the theological books are, you know, and, and sorry, you know, all the commentaries, you know, they're thick and big coming from those. Two the books. Romans, I, it's a great analogy because it's hard. Um, maybe I'm speaking for myself here. It's hard to preach on Romans because it's a thicker argument. It's a it's a deep theological argument. And that does not always translate in the pulpit. And then you've got that compared to a great story that Jesus just telling in Matthew. And you say, oh, that story re resonates. You got to throw John in there. Absolutely. So um, now, it's very interesting here, uh, Romans, uh, we're starting Romans 9 Sunday. Mm -hmm. That whole section 9 to 11 is Paul trying to wrestle with why is it that the Jews are not flocking to the Messiah? They're reading Isaiah. Mm. Why are they not coming to faith? And he's struggling. He's struggling with that. There's not an obvious answer. So he, he, for those three chapters, 
he's going, well, it must be part of God's providence and, and, and his people, of course, Paul, my people, uh, rejected so that the Gentiles can come to faith. But what does that mean? Are they going to be judged? And anyways, he, he's trying to figure it all out. Finally, he ends up with a doxology. <laughs> you know, it's basically, praise, praise God. God must know what God's doing because. But he goes this Sunday, he said, I would, because he's reading the suffering sermon, I would suffer if my people would come. You know, it's like the parent, you watch your child suffer, and you'd say, gladly, gladly, I would take that suffering for my child. But do you ever wonder that if you had lived at the time Jesus lived where you would have been at in your head? Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you would have lost me at John the Baptist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That would have been the first one, and I, I would have had a hard time, I'm sure, skeptic that I am. Especially if he wasn't the gorgeous, charismatic mm -hmm. leader that we paint him. Then it all yeah. of a sudden becomes more difficult. Maybe we, you know, you'd say, "Ah, that's not the leader I was expecting." Mm -hmm. What do you mean you're going to the cross? That's not, you know. So, yeah, he's not a military general. He's not the fighting type. Mm -hmm. You know, what is he, right? And you're trying to. I, I like the chosen for that reason because you 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 kind of mm -hmm. sense some of the struggles there. He was a king and a priest. Let me just point out one more um, verse. This is one that we, um, chapter, this is one we don't emphasize because it's not part of our own, you know, spirituality. But chapter 46, you do, you, you heard that, and I just want to point it out, you heard that in the Bible project. But these, uh, are the uh, children of Israel coming back to Jerusalem, and they're not happy. Oh, the wall isn't as strong, the temple isn't as gorgeous. No. There's disappointment, there's struggle, the crops aren't flowing with milk and honey. It's not going well. There are struggles even with our, you know, brothers and sisters who stayed back in Jerusalem. And now we don't like them, they don't like us. Remember Ezra and Nehemiah, right? Mm -hmm. so there are struggles here. And so when you're tempted, what are some people saying? Well, maybe the gods of Babylon weren't, weren't so bad. They weren't so <laughs> weren't so bad. Bad. Come on, let's can we talk about that? Because Babylon seemed to be powerful, and, and yeah. now yeah. Cyrus had just defeated them. So Cyrus becomes now in the text like the Messiah. It's actually considered the Messiah because he's come in to feed the Babylonians, and he says, "You go back to Jerusalem." This is all part of Isaiah's prophecy. Oh, and Cyrus made it happen. Which is why, even in, in the last election, politically, um, people started to, to say, Who's Cyrus? Right? Mm -hmm. The irreligious person, Cyrus, the pagan, but who's doing God's will. Mm -hmm. right? So they're reaching into this story and quoting this Cyrus. Uh, but the, I'm pointing out here the temptation, the temptation of 46. Bell bows down, Nebo stoops low. Their idols are born by beasts of burden. They're just putting them down here. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all you who remain of the house of Israel, you whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried since your birth, this is God speaking to them, mm -hmm. reminding them of his uh, uh, parental background. Mm -hmm. um, it's me and no other. He's faithful. So, but that's what's being questioned, Patrick. That's what's being questioned. They're saying, is God faithful? Yes. Why did he allow this to happen oh, yeah. to us? Oh, this, is, this was awful. You heard this after the Holocaust, right? How could God have allowed that? And sometimes we say that. How could God have allowed this to happen to me? This was awful. And so that's why I think this, this text, we would skip over it because we're not into uh, bell worship or Nebo worship, uh, but it's idolatry. Again. It's doubting that God is, is caring for us and thinking there must be something else 
that'll work for me. Right, right above that in 45, 22, he says, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I am sworn, for my mouth has gone forth in righteousness, a word that shall not return to me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Before that God. Jesus Christ is Lord. Yeah. Lord. Yeah. So that's where, who, who quotes that in the New Testament? Paul. Exactly, right? There's a, the canonic verses in Philippians, I think it is. So uh, I'll end with this. Remember the last vision. There will be the wicked who are destroyed, this, yeah. this group. However, all the nations will be drawn to Jerusalem. All nations will bow down and worship. Paul picks up on this and says, in the end times, not everyone is saved, but most are saved. They're referring to these texts, if you go that direction. Now, there are some texts that say the gate is narrow, you know, and the way is so. So that's in the New Testament. But this strain of New Testament theology is Isaiah, it's Paul, that God will show up and everybody will say, even my doubt or my lack of faith, um, everyone will come to faith. They'll see Jesus for who he is, this, this suffering servant, the one who died. So if you hear that theology at times, it's not all saved in Isaiah, but it is this compelling vision that the Messiah shows up, the suffering servant, and it draws all people and all knees will bow and all every time will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. So, uh, so it's, it's quite... It's quite Maybe a, it's it's congruent. It's harmonious. Okay. So uh, Paul's done his Isaiah Bible study. Yeah. <laughs> and he did it without the Bible project. <laughs> Let's end with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this vision of your faithfulness to us each and every day. Great is your faithfulness. So we pray, Lord, that we would remember that and bless and praise your holy name all that you do to us and how you've been faithful to Israel and you are faithful to us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can actually do another week on yeah. Isaiah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right.